Hi everyone, I'm Jana Rieger, host of the Enjoy the Life You're Living podcast, and today I'm really looking forward to this conversation with Nicole Bendeley. She is the Executive Director of Waterstone Culture Institute, where she's helping companies build high-performance culture and high-performance teams. Nicole's one high-achieving person herself. She has her own podcast that's called Leading on Purpose, and she's a celebrated author in the area of team performance. She has spent a lot of time in healthcare um, and in the complex environment of healthcare, helping teams to find joy and meaning. Um, In our conversation today, you're going to hear about people skills that leaders need to think about. You're going to hear about the importance of valuing and trusting each other. You're also going to hear about how leaders can learn and grow and shift in how they show up and that, you know what, you maybe as a leader don't need to know everything. Um, We also explore the topic of hierarchical role-based leadership and how that is going the way of the dodo um, and that there's a really big shift in what millennials want in a leader. And on that note, if you're recruiting new team members, Nicole will tell you what's key and what potential employees are looking for. So thanks for joining me today. And here we go. Hi, everyone. My name is Jana Rieger. I'm the host of the Enjoy the Life You're Living podcast. And I'm really excited today to have my guest, Nicole Bendeley, with me. Nicole's a healthcare leadership expert, and we're going to dive right into some exciting questions on leadership. And I think first, Nicole, what would be um, important is to just welcome you to the podcast, first of all. And um, I'd love to hear a little bit about your story. How did you get involved with leadership um, and what took you on the road to where you are now in your career? Sure. Great question. Well, thank you for having me, Jan. I've been looking forward to this conversation and, and, you know, healthcare in particular has a a special place in my heart. So I'm excited to to jump into that. Um, How did I end up in this field? You know, it was, I I think if we're lucky, um, we, we kind of, we either choose the right purpose or we stumble into our purpose um, through experience and trial and error. So I was the latter, you know, and um, early in my career, right out of university, I started moving up pretty quickly in financial services and marketing was leading a team. And I realized early on that I didn't want my boss's job, my boss's boss's job. I wasn't all that pumped about our Back then it was direct mail, right? It was all about direct mail. I wasn't excited about our open rates, response rates, all of that. I was more energized about my team Mm -hmm. and helping my team. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky to have a mom who started a business in team and leadership development in the early 80s, back when teaming was the buzzword it was new team building was new um and so one day (laughs) I decided to quit my job with one of the big five Canadian banks you know didn't give a second thought to pension or (laughs) benefits this was before kids and before mortgage I was like I'm just gonna leave and I'm gonna join my mom much to my mother's surprise um and, uh, and I, I just really jumped into the business um, with my mom in, in jumping into leading uh, sessions for clients around leadership. Um, and I just I fell in love and I really taught myself along the way and my clients taught me I learned from leaders I coached. Um, and um, had the opportunity then to work with an organization in healthcare that asked us to define what a culture of patient safety looks like in healthcare, mm-hmm. right? As a result of the to, to Ares Human article and research that came out by the Institute of, of Healthcare, um, a significant focus became on patient safety um, in, in, in Canada and the US. And so that launched me into healthcare from the perspective of truly understanding you know, what is unique about healthcare environments Mm -hmm. um, and how do teams and leaders and individuals need to show up every day 
to not only deliver the best care, deliver the safest care, but to ensure that everybody is finding joy and meaning and having a positive experience along the way. And so that was my entrance into healthcare. Um, um, but really it was just about, you know, recognizing early on that where I was and the, the path that I thought I was meant for was not for me. And maybe having the naivete <laughs> in my early 20s and freedom <laughs> to sort of jump ship from a very secure role to trying, you know, entrepreneurship and something new. And I, it was, I, I fell in love with it. And so now, you know, even back then, but what gets me up in the morning is just helping people to thrive a little more throughout the day and struggle a whole lot less um, by removing the complexity that we kind of create for ourselves when we lead um, especially in healthcare, that's a very complex environment as it is. Sometimes when we lead, we can add more complexity to something that, that doesn't need to be complex when it's about interacting with each other on our teams and ensuring we're having the best possible experience along the way to the same goal that we have, which is delivering the best care possible. Yeah. So, so yeah, so that's a long winded, um, how did I, where did I start off? <laughs> but there's so much in that, Nicole, like, um, you know, there, there's so much to pull out of that. So first of all, you know, it's interesting to hear that this was thinking about how this was a new concept in the 80s um, and something that your mom had gotten into and brought you and, and you joined her. What are the changes that you've seen over the course of that time um, in the yeah. business, essentially? Especially yeah, great, great question. So I joined the organization, it's 2022 now. So I think 2002. So, um, and I have since transitioned out of my, my family business and I'm now with Waterstone, which is, we can chat about um, um, later. Um, but the, the, we've seen a lot of shifts, right? Um, in particular, I think one of the biggest shifts I've seen, and I'm not going to make a blanket statement that every healthcare organization, every system, every hospital is, is there yet, but certainly a shift in the recognition of the kind of leader that's needed, not just in healthcare, but in particular in healthcare. That sort of top-down hierarchical, my way or the highway, rigid leadership, um, is, 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 I want to say I'm, is, is no longer the, the desired kind of leader, mm -hmm. not saying they don't exist today in healthcare. They do, they exist in, in lots of industries and organizations. Um, but I think there's a growing recognition of the need of a different kind of leadership and far more investment and focus on ensuring the experience people have every day in the delivery of care is one that's meaningful and positive. And the recognition that in order to influence and create a positive experience, that comes through leadership. That comes through our direct interactions and trust we have in our leaders and the feeling that my leader has my back. They care about me as a human being. Hmm. It's not just about me being the nurse or the PT or, or you know, social worker. Hmm. It's me as a human being and knowing that my leader cares about me and the journey hmm. that I'm on. And there's greater recognition of the importance of that. We even see, you know, um, at the IHI in the States, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, a number of years ago, this isn't, you know, this year or during COVID, this was, you know, maybe five years ago, I can't remember when, but mm -hmm. launched the joy in work framework, right? They, they, a significant amount of research that shows that when let's use nurses as an example, experience joy through their work, that we see reduced errors, improved patient outcomes, certainly less burnout from nurses, right? Less turnover. Um, and we experience joy when we're connected to something meaningful, when we know that the work we do, the energy we put in, all of our effort has an impact and we feel valued for that impact and we feel valued for making a difference, right? 
And, and so the fact that the IHI has created a joy in work framework for leaders to recognize their people, to have conversations and dialogue, to understand what is meaningful for each of their team members, to connect them to the value that they bring, um, speaks volumes around the recognition and awareness in an industry that is so evidence-based that this so-called softer skills are the hard skills and, and are incredibly essential. It's not just the, you know, the, the, the technical skills that we bring as leaders. It, it has to be these, these skills, these people skills that are most important. So I, I, I've seen a big shift there from a culture perspective. Mm -hmm. in healthcare. That's interesting. And, you know, I think because in healthcare, um, there, there might be the assumption that you get meaning simply by the job that you have. You're saving lives. You're helping people feel better. Um, do you think that that has played into a lack of focus on actually implementing programs that would um, bring joy to people? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, it's yes, people choose. It's a special, special kind of person as we've, you know, we've, we've, we've always known, I hope that chooses healthcare yeah. um, as a profession as you know, something that they're choosing to give their lives to and yeah. especially over the past two years, right? It's, yeah. it's never yeah. been more evident. Um, and so yes, I mean, people choose the the career because of the impact to, to people for the most part. Um, and there's, there, it's a values-based choice. However, that's not to say that that, that the meaning, uh, meaningful contributions to, you know, society and the community and those that you care for, um, that in and of itself is not going to prevent burnout. Hmm. or support mental health and well-being or to to necessarily um, create a healthy cohesive environment where we need to pull together in 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 that common goal of delivering care that that sense that sense of um, ability to um, stay highly engaged, stay energized is it happens when we're part of a group of people who value each other. And not just value the fact that we're here doing the same work. Um, we value each other and we show that we're there for each other. We recognize when we've, we, we've you know, um, had a near miss and we miss that, you know, that almost mistake. And we, we recognize that and we learn from that and we show value in that. That makes me feel good. That makes me feel that I can... I can um, share learning and be recognized for that in my job and there's room for growth along the way. And then I'm not gonna be, people aren't gonna point their fingers at me and make me feel bad, right? And so, yes, we derive energy from the work that we do, but unless we're working in an environment that is energizing to us based on the interactions we have with our leaders and our, our team members, we're gonna go home feeling depleted, not just because of the work, but because of the interactions that we have with our team members on a daily basis. Um, and so it's, it's about the relationships. That's how we ins help ensure people are leaving less depleted as a result of the work. Hmm. Does that make sense? I don't know. It does. And it's, uh, you know, it's interesting. We were just having a conversation at one of our team meetings um, in True Angle, and um, we were talking about, you know, when mistakes are made, they're just, that's going to happen. That's part of the, the shtick. Um, and how do we, what's the best way to just support each other through those right. things when they happen? So what I'm interested to know from you is, is that something that just either happens on a team or not, like they're either supportive of each other or they're not, or what can a leader do to really make all of that okay? Yeah, such a great question. And I wish there was a simple answer. So <laughs> that was what I thought. I thought yeah, oh, I bet there's not one thing that you there's can not because if we peel the onion and go back to the foundation of we'll say a high performing healthcare team, 
Um, in order to share learning, like sh talking about mistakes is all about sharing learning. It's about, you know, um, being vulnerable to share learning um, and to receive feedback and to, you know, um, respond to mistakes in, an, in a, what can we learn from this as opposed to reactive pointing fling fingers, you know, blame approach. That requires a foundation of trust and a foundation of psychological safety. And so if learning isn't happening organically, um, then a couple of things is that A, um, is the leader prioritizing learning? Mm. Um, how are they intentionally finding opportunities to learn? for their staff to learn with and from one another in the sharing of mistakes or near misses, almost mistakes. Um, and three, is it safe to do so, right? Is, is it safe for people to speak up and say, hey, I have a question, right? I'm not sure how to do this, or I need help, I'm feeling overwhelmed, or I think I almost made this mistake, can we, you know, I, let's learn from it. Hmm. Um, um, and is, are there systems in place that communicate in the hospital, learning from mistakes is part of the way we do things around here. Do they track near misses? Is there formal processes, you know, to, to encourage the sharing of learning, mm -hmm. um, and mistakes, right? So it's, there's multiple things that need to come together, but at the, at the foundation, it's about do, does it feel safe here to learn and to share? Um, and if not, then even if there are systems in place, it's going to be very difficult to do so. So that's where we need to start is with the climate of the team to build that trust, that safety to speak up and engage the team and asking, how do we wanna to learn together? How, when, we, when we have a mistake, how are we gonna approach it together, right? Um, and so, but it has to come back to the foundation of a healthy team climate and based in trust and psychological safety. Yeah. So, so there's that whole difference between something being organic and then something being systematized essentially. And, and that makes me think of another question that I wanted to ask, yeah. which is around leadership. Do you think that there are, there's such a thing as a born leader or do you think we can cultivate good leaders through teaching? We can 100% cultivate leadership. Leadership is a journey. Mm -hmm. There is no end point. It's not like, yeah, I'm the, I finally made it. I'm the best leader ever. <laughs> and I've learned everything I'm ever going to need to learn. And I got the certificate. Now I'm done. Yeah. No, yeah. It, it is a journey. Um, however, um, I do believe it's easier for some mm -hmm. um, to learn and grow and shift, hmm. right, in, in how they show up. Um, I think, you know, what I've learned in my experience with healthcare is that, you know, healthcare has traditionally been a very hierarchical, very role-based, right? Um, <laughs> or a complex um, system and where the hierarchy determines, you know, uh, the, the way communication happens, the level of empowerment that you feel, you know, the ability to influence. And we're seeing that shift now. Um, but traditionally I see healthcare leaders, you know, they've grown up, especially our boomers, not necessarily our millennials, but, the older generation, um, or my I'm Gen X, yeah, yeah. um, where you've grown up in an environment where you've sort of created this leadership armor. You've mm -hmm. built this armor as you've grown up in healthcare because it was it's an it's a culture that has traditionally been the leader is always right, the leader is there to fix, has to have all the solutions. Mm -hmm. and be the directive, right? You, you direct, you have the answers, right? It's, it's, it was not an environment for leaders to learn how to be vulnerable. 
it's it's has it it wasn't an environment where where leaders could say i don't know what do you think right or to coach up to have a coach about approach and throw the the ball back to the nurse who's coming to the nurse manager with another interpersonal issue and the nurse manager says okay leave that with me i'll deal with it and the nurse is on their way right um and so depending on the environment and culture that we have grown up in as leaders, how we've been taught, you know, that's a lot of armor to shed. And so when we coach mm. and develop um, leaders in healthcare, it's, it's about re it's about connecting to um, why a new kind of leadership is so essential and how that helps them, right? How it helps you, the leader, to say, to step out of the center of the circle and enable others to step up and take on more by coaching and knowing that you don't have to have all the answers. Actually, the best leaders don't have all the answers. The best mm -hmm. lead leaders tap their team for the answers, right? And empower them in their roles. Um, and so when we work with leaders in healthcare at the, at the Waterstone Culture Institute and, and previously in my many years of coaching, it's the, the best part for me, one of the best parts is when leaders, they get, it says, oh, hmm. you don't have to show up that way. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to have the broadest shoulders ever and know everything and fix everything and be everyone to every, everything to everyone. It's the first, it's a sense of relief. And then it's, oh, how am I going to do that? Right. Or, you know, and then needing the tools to be able to apply in the work. But it's first of all, recognizing the kind of shifts that that leaders do need to make. Yeah. Um, and the, the changes in expectations that millennials have of their leaders. Right. That's that shifted you know, um, as well as far as the kind of leader we need in an organization. It is no longer a one size fits all leader. It's mm. bespoke leadership now. It's mm. leaders, it used to be you changed to me. This is my style, take it or leave it. You adapt your communication to me because I'm your leader. That doesn't work anymore. If we want real engagement and ownership within organizations and retention, um, especially in healthcare, we want that retention, um, then we need a leader who is able to connect with each person at a human level and, and build those meaningful relationships um, with each member, which is really challenging for healthcare when the span of control, I don't even like that term, but leaders have so many people who report into them. Yeah. Um, and so then it becomes, how is that leader enabling other leaders, informal leaders, you know, within their team to be leaders, to connect, to share information, to, to, um, you know, play the role of, of the, to take up pieces that that leader can't do by themselves and building that cohesion in the team. Yeah. So maybe this is, um, this next question is about patience and how, you know, if we think about hierarchy long time ago, the patients were kind of just, um, you know, they did whatever the healthcare team said. Um, that really has changed over the years where the patients become core and center of their care. Uh, so how do you think leaders who have all this other stuff going on, how can they um, add to patient empowerment? Mm. What can they do to promote that? Yeah, it's a, it's a really, really great question. And, and I'm not I'm not going to pretend that I'm an expert in that piece. Yeah. Um, I'll just share experiences that I've had as you know, that, that, that can relate to this. You know, when I was working with um, a hospital here in Ontario to help them um, develop an assessment to measure healthcare team effectiveness, a really big piece of it was wanting the patient's voice 
in designing this assessment in in determining what does a high performance healthcare team look like mm-hmm. as the patient right and so you know that's the first step understanding what patients need from their healthcare teams right in order to feel empowered right and some of the 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 learning we gained is you know i want to be heard I, I want to be treated as a human being. I keep, I'm going to keep coming back to this and not with the hat of patient. Yeah. I want to feel connected. A, I want to feel connected to my team. I want to know who my team is. Um, I want to understand everybody's role that they play. Um, and I want to have a voice. And when we define what does voice mean, I want to be heard. I want to feel free to ask as many questions as I want without feeling like an idiot, right? Yeah. Or without yeah. feeling, yeah. oh, I've only got 30 seconds to answer these questions because they're, they're, they've already checked out and they're looking towards the next patient they have to go see, right? Yeah. I mean, I feel that when yeah. I'm, you know, oh, she's probably got, I got I to gotta ask quickly and maybe I shouldn't ask this, taking up her time, right? And so it is similar. It's the same, interestingly, sort of concepts or practices that we would apply to leading our team members, like connecting, ensuring they feel heard, ensuring they have a voice, ensuring that they feel that their their perspective is taken into consideration and not shut down, right? You know, um, and and, and making sure they feel valid, validated, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, and that is about relationship. That is about communication. That is about the trust building um, mm. with that with that patient. Um, and so, you know, that's the extent of what I can say on that topic. But yeah, um, yeah it, it, the, there are more and more hospitals in that I've worked with who, you know, um, put patients at the center of that team yeah. and are, are very intentional in what that looks like. Have you ever seen any cases where uh, I'm moving over to thinking about technology now? So have you ever seen cases or worked with a group where technology has actually either facilitated or hindered that connection between the patient and the care team? Yeah, really great question. I, I, I haven't. I, I, I haven't seen that. I mean, where I do see technology impacting a team yeah um is less about the actual technology and more about how that technology is introduced Mm -hmm. um right and the degree to which team members are able to adopt it and be and and support the use of it right and so i i see it more from a, a a change management piece enabling people to move out of the fear of I'm never going to know how to use this or the 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 thinking about this is taking up going to take too much of my time who made this decision nobody consulted us what's the point it's not going to better patient care and staying in that mindset um, without having the opportunity to talk it through and be engaged in the process of, of integrating the technology effectively And so um, I see it more from the poor change management, (laughs) the impact of poor integration from a change management and and the people side of change than the the use of the technology and how it impacts the patient. Yeah, yeah, I think that's bang on, definitely. Um, Let's see, what else did I wanna ask you here? I had another thought of a question, Nicole. Oh, geez. And it went just as quick as it came into my head, it went back out. Um, Let me just think for a second, because it it would. Okay, yeah, I got it. Um, So we've talked about the way that there's, there was a hierarchical structure in healthcare and in leadership, and that's kind of changed and and is moving to a different place with the new generation that's here. Yeah, I think Uh, there'll always be a hierarchy. That's the nature of healthcare and the roles, but I think there's far more trust and a different approach within the system and the hierarchy. Yeah, just so that, just to clarify that. 
For sure, for sure. Because then that sets up this next part of the question yeah. really well. Do you see, you work across all kinds of businesses, not just healthcare. So how are other businesses, let's just say, um, again, let's look into healthcare technology companies or something around healthcare. Um, how do they differ from the teams and the leadership that is within the system? Or are, are there similarities, differences between teams yeah. that function in healthcare and teams that function in business? Yeah, there are. There are. And that was sort of the crux of, of the, the research that, that I did alongside of my mother in, in 2004. My gosh, that was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> in you know, when we embarked on this, uh, on defining what a culture of patient safety looks like and really defining that for a, a measurement tool that we created to measure culture within healthcare, um, we asked the question, are healthcare teams different? Because up until that point, we just assumed a team is a team is a team. And we had you know, a number of team assessments and all of these things that we were using at a bank and at a, in a hospital and an obstetrical unit, for example. And through this research, we identified that yes, of course, healthcare teams are different. How are they different? Well, they're the, the stress, first of all, that they experience in being a high reliability organization and impacting lives, right? that creates a different dynamic, mm -hmm. right? Um, communication is important in any company, any industry. It's even more important in healthcare, in mm -hmm. aviation, in certain organizing, right? Types of mm -hmm. industries. So communication, and we know through, you know, to air is human, and they're going back and looking at some of this data, but communication is one of the biggest reasons for errors and, mm -hmm. and unnecessary patient deaths. It comes back to, you know, avoidable patient deaths um, to communication. We, so communication is even more important. Um, and then thirdly, what we noticed was some nuances around learning. So let's say in a health tech organization, um, the kind of learning that we see, for example, is more around innovation. You know, mm -hmm. learning for the purpose of innovating and driving forward, right? Um, trying new things, mm -hmm. um, it, taking risks, right? That looks different in healthcare. When you say we got to take risks in, in a hospital <laughs> on a frontline team, <laughs> no way, right? Yeah. Yeah. Risk taking looks different. Risk taking in healthcare, which which also applies to non healthcare. But when we talk about risk taking in healthcare, it's more interpersonal risks. How safe is it for me to take a risk and say I almost made this mistake? Um, and so it looks more like innovation. Learning looks more like innovating in in an, in a private sector organization or in like a health tech organization. Whereas in healthcare, it's about shared learning, learning with and from one another for the purpose of um, Im improving our ability to deliver care, um, making, you know, learning from the almost mistake or the mistake that we made, um, improving our practice. It's not about, you know, there is innovation in healthcare, don't get me wrong, in the healthcare system, but from a healthcare frontline healthcare team, it's more about learning. And it's more about um, open communication more so. It's not that open communication isn't important in any company, but we saw that as two indicators that, that stood out more in our healthcare data. Hmm. What we see that stands out more in our non-healthcare data is, is um, the ability to lead high, high impact meetings, hmm. right, as a leader. Um, whereas in healthcare, you know, we have huddles, we have, you know, it's, it's a different kind of interaction and meetings. Mm -hmm. And so we saw sort of group work skills from a meeting perspective, how we interact in, in meetings and our use our meeting time to drive business results as an indicator that we didn't see as of a high performance team that we didn't see in healthcare. Got it. Got it. Um, one of the podcasts that I'd listened to of yours, you were talking about this crazy statistic that 70% of people are not finding joy in their work. Yes. Um, now, was that specific to healthcare or is that across the board? 
And if it's across the board, what do we do about this? I know it's across the board. It's across the board, that statistic. Um, and I'll have to go back. I think that was, I can't remember if that was during COVID, pre-COVID. I'll have to go back to, to, the, to the date of that research. Um, but it's interesting right now. So, you know, at Waterstone Human Capital, we've got the Waterstone Culture Institute that I head up that's all about building high performance cultures and leaders who have the ability to, you know, lead in a way that enables people to be their best. We also have our um, executive search practice, and they are seeing through the executive search practice a real shift in the market from a candidate's perspective. And I think to a great degree because of a lack of joy in work. We're hearing from candidates now more and more different questions that we wouldn't get. It's, it's all about wanting to understand the purpose of the organization that they're interviewing for, right? Is that purpose aligned to me and my values? Mm. The, the, this term, the great resignation that we're hearing about right now, it's very real and organizations are feeling it, healthcare and otherwise. Um, and it comes down to, you know, this reflection and awakening that a lot of people have had who have had the, who have the privilege to leave and to, to choose where mm -hmm. they want to be and have options that they're doing that soul searching around what kind of organization will it feel good to be at, right? People are looking for an experience now, not a job. Mm -hmm. and experience and we're hearing candidates saying you know wanting to understand the purpose of the organization wanting to truly understand the culture and wanting to understand what is the, what are you the organization going to do to show me you're just as invested in me as a person in my growth and in 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 me being able to be my best as you expect me to be invested in your company and your customers, right? So, so it, it is people derive me joy through meaning, through mm -hmm. meaning of, um, it's interesting because a, a Victor Frankl quote um, mm -hmm. from uh, Man's Search for Meaning, and I'm going to, I'm going to butcher this quote, but he, he, he basically says, you know, meaning is found in, in three ways through, uh, uh, relationships through love, right? And we can find it doesn't have to be romantic love. It's love through the relationships that we have at work, right? For example, um, meaning is derived through demonstrating courage in difficult times, right? And meaning is found through the work that we do. And, you know, organizations have gone through difficult times. And we can derive meaning through that when we are connected to each other, when we support each other through the storm and, and demonstrate courage together and vulnerability together. People derive meaning from that. And so if, if they didn't, if people didn't feel that connection and meaning in their work through COVID, they, they're leaving, they're looking mm -hmm. for new opportunities and that's gonna be top of mind for them when they're choosing the next place to go. And candidates have choice right now. It's a candidate's market. Um, and yeah, so organizations are finally, you know, waking up more and more and more to the fact that culture is not a factor. It's the factor, right? Mm -hmm. There's the Peter Drucker quote, of course, culture eats strategy for breakfast. I say it eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and a midnight snack. And, you know, it's, it's no longer, thankfully, whether culture drives performance of the organization, whether healthcare patient outcomes or, you know, profits, it's how will we leverage our culture to drive the performance of our business? And how will we build our leaders, support our leaders in, in creating and crafting that culture? Um, so that we do retain, so that we do ensure people are experiencing joy and able to bring their best selves to work every day, who are leaving less burnt out, yeah. and all of those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting, as we've been doing some recruitment lately, um, we've been asked what are, what are our values? What's our company values? Um, and it's a, such a funny thing, because I can remember probably about 15 years, 
15, 20 years ago when we were hiring within the health system, one of the questions that was on every um, list of questions for candidates was, can you tell us the mission of our hospital, right? So we were asking people if pretty much had you looked us up and do you right. know what our values are? And, and this was when this happened, when people were asking us, like, what are your values? It's like, wow, this is, it's pretty cool, actually, because, you know, you'll get people, it's a, it's a better way for them to understand if they are a fit in the first place. Um, for the cultures that you have. And it's a good check for companies to, to understand that that's really important. Um, so that brings me to you, the book that you've written, and uh, it's called Improving Healthcare Team Performance. And I suspect maybe you've already talked about some of these, but you have seven essentials in that book for any high performing team. And I thought it'd be really cool to highlight what you think are the top three things that leaders should be looking at for us. Yeah, great question. So um, first and foremost, climate, um, a healthy team climate, which is all about you know, building a foundation of, of psychological safety where people feel free to um, know that it's not risky to ask, to raise their hand and ask a question or to say I'm overwhelmed or to, you know, to say I've, I've made a mistake. Um, so the trust and psychological safety and foundation of respect. Without that, it is very difficult to strengthen any of the other elements. So if there is a lack of respect, if there is a, a trust issue within the team or between, you know, very much an us versus them, leader versus team and team versus leaders approach, um, that's where we, that's the focus needs to be is on, on, on building a healthy climate. Um, the next piece is the, the cohesion um, in the team. And, you know, a cohesive team is really defined as, you know, pulling, pulling in the same direction towards a common goal. Um, now that common goal is, is pretty clear, you know, deliver, you know, usually deliver the best care possible, but the how isn't always clear, right? And how we're going to operate as a team in order to have the best experience delivering that care, in order to deliver the best patient experience in the delivery of that care. What are our group norms? How do we need to show up together? What do we expect of each other, right? So, so the how we're going to do that is, is the next piece in clarifying, you know, you know, what are those sort of team agreements? How do, how do we show trust? How do we show respect for each other? How are we going to communicate together? Um, and really defining that and enabling the team to clarify what they need from each other and their leader to be their best selves, as opposed to the leader assuming what they need um, and, and team members assuming what they need about each other. So for example, oftentimes, in particular, I note I notice more in healthcare teams than other teams for for some reason. Gossip is a big issue, right? And that can can affect trust and team dynamics. So even talking about gossip as you know zero tolerance and why and how we're going to approach that together, right? So building the dialogue around what's most important to us, how are we going to show up effectively to be our best selves in the delivery of care. So that's the cohesive piece. And then, um, you know, it's hard to choose the third because it's kind of a choose your own adventure depending on the needs of your team. So one of the reasons why we, we develop the seven elements is not just to say, well, of course to say, this is what a high performance team looks like, but not to say you have to be perfect in all seven because that's just mm -hmm. unrealistic. Mm -hmm. It's to say, where are we strong right now? And what's one element that we need to focus on right now that will make us better, right? So to be able to choose one. So one, for example, with one, one health care organization we're, we're working with um, at Waterstone is the recognition that they need to strengthen. One of the elements is their change compatibility. The, you know, the healthcare team is going through a ton of change They've experienced a ton of change. Mm -hmm. they, they have a high degree of respect for each other. They have strong cohesion. Now we need to learn how to transition during change together and, and how to 
you know, integrate technology, for example, that's coming in a way that we're going to be able to support it as opposed to resist it. Um, another team is looking at shared learning, which is another element. How do we want to, because it's not happening organically, we, we've got psychological safety, but the learning isn't happening organically because we're heads down doing the work and we're not intentionally incorporating opportunities to dialogue and learn together throughout the course of our day. Um, or week. And so that's an element that they're choosing to focus on, right? So, but the most important are climate and cohesion. Mm. They, they influence open communication. And then the others are, you know, dealer's choice, whichever is right? <laughs> to, the, to the team. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, so interesting. There's so much to uh, that we could dive into, Nicole. It's been just such a rich conversation, um, but I'm aware of the time. And um, I have one last question that I ask all my listeners, and that is, what does the phrase enjoy the life you're living mean to you? Yeah, when I, you know, when I first saw that in, in your email, when we first connected, it, it brought almost brought tears to my eyes because I am guilty most of the time of not enjoying yeah. the moments, like every moment, right? Um, and so enjoy the life you're living means to, to me to be grateful for the moments that you're living now, for finding time in your day just to breathe and connect and, and be grateful for the work that you're doing, be grateful for the, the smile you got you know, walking down the street or just take moments to notice and be in gratitude. Um, and that's about just being present as much as you can as on the way to where you might need to go. You know, a lot of people have massive changes they're making to their lives, massive struggles they're dealing with. So I'm not trying to simplify it, you know, in any way. Um, but I have found that that, that enjoying the life you're living comes from noticing the life you're living, <laughs> right? Yes, you know, for sure. Right? Um, and taking joy in that and gratitude in, in the everyday little moments that you have. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Nicole. This has been just a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate your insights into leadership and team culture. Thank you so much, Jenna. It's been an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate you know, being invited to have this conversation and, and that you're creating space for these conversations and, and, um, and really dedicated to, you know, to helping and making a difference. So, so thank you for including me. You're welcome.